All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for Sleep School 101. My name is Lauren Apicella, Associate Director of Alumni Relations, and with my colleagues, Dean Prashant Malavia, Dean Kerry Pace, Sarah Tillotson, we are pleased to offer this session as part of Operation Cure Personalis. Um, Operation Cure Personalis is a series that encourages the entire McDonough community to make more meaningful connections and take care of themselves and each other with events and workshops that focus on mental health and well being. With stress levels higher than ever right now, sleep is critically important to wellness. So I'd like to introduce Kristen Rainey, founder and CEO of the North Star Sleep School, who will lead us through our workshop today um, in order to help us take care of ourselves and improve our sleep. So thank you so much for being here, Kristen. As a quick note, uh, we'd like to ask you all to use the chat function to participate in the webinar today. And please remember to send your chats to all panelists and attendees. Um, but if you're having any technical difficulties, use the Q&A function and I can help you out. So with that, thanks so much, Kristen, and let's get started. Wonderful. Uh, thanks, Lauren, and thanks, Carrie. It's great to be here today. Um, as folks continue to trickle in, um, I'd love to ask for everyone to enter into the chat board with your affiliation with Georgetown uh, and where you're calling in from today. That would be really great for me to see uh, the massive range. We had quite a range on Wednesday when we did another session and uh, I'd be excited to hear more about all of you. So um, you can go ahead and just select panelists and attendees in the chat board and share with us uh, your affiliation and where you're calling in from. Um, so again, thanks to Georgetown for having me and special thanks uh, to Christine Kidwell from Georgetown's Business for Impact program. Uh, I'm really excited to have the opportunity to share more with all of you about a topic that has taken on increased importance for me personally, so much so that I left my job at Google a year ago and I'm now focusing my time and energy full time on uh, launching and now running North Star Sleep School, a business that's focused on sharing with others how they can get better sleep. And great, there seems like a, a wide range in where folks are calling in from, that's fantastic. I'm now gonna share my slides with all of you. Great, so here is what we're gonna to cover today. Um, quite a lot of different topics and we'll have a chance for um, a lot of questions as well. So if you think of things throughout the call, feel free to, to use the chat board. So I'd like to share a little bit of context on how I got to the point of talking with all of you today about sleep. Um, this was a photo taken in 2018 in a moment of serious sleep deprivation. Uh, this was from a passport photo shop in Portland, Oregon, where I lived for about a decade. And, you know, I think it's fair to say all passport photos are pretty horrendous. Uh, this one was probably the worst. Um, and it's really just showing how completely exhausted and stressed out I was. Um, the context is I was trying to figure out how to apply for a Chinese visa and an Indian visa at the same time for upcoming work trips. And then I also learned that I didn't have enough passport pages and I wasn't able to part with my current passport because I was about to leave on another trip to Copenhagen for works in 10 days. So it was a stressful time. And um, you can see that I was quite uh, exhausted in the photo. That year in 2018, I flew 175,000 miles just for work. And for those of you who are road warriors, uh, you know that that's actually quite, quite a lot. Um, it sounds glamorous, but it really wasn't. I was exhausted. I was on the road all the time. And I thought I wanted to be on the path. Um, you know, I thought, I thought that this was the path I wanted to be on. I, I worked really hard in high school. I gone to Princeton undergrad, and then I studied sustainable food and international affairs at the Fletcher School at Tufts. And then I got my MBA at Google, or sorry, at Cornell, uh, and then eventually made my way to Google. And um, I really thought I had my dream job there. I was leading sustainability and procurement for Google's global food program, which ran cafes for our employees at our offices around the world. But after four years into my six year stint at Google, I recognized that I was prioritizing my job above all else. Uh, and that has a real cost. You know, I was on the road all the time, as I've mentioned, and it really wasn't uncommon for me to be up at 3.45 a.m. for flights on a Monday. And that's a really brutal way to start the week. Um, I'm sure some of you can relate to that. Um, you know, when you know on a Saturday night that you're gonna be getting up at 3.45 a.m. on a Monday morning, you're already thinking about that and you might 
leave that Saturday night dinner party before dessert's even served because you're already thinking about that Monday morning flight. And this erosion of my personal life um, didn't happen overnight. Um, my, my work and, and my personal life weren't in balance. Um, you know, I thought it was reasonable, for example, um, if I was already in London for a work trip to tack on another 10 hour flight to visit a friend in Nairobi for three days, or I'd get home from a work, another work trip in, in Dublin, completely in the wrong time zone, and I'd, I'd immediately hop on my bike and, and go ride my bike literally all day um, to clear my head. And my body was tired, but I went anyway. I, I didn't listen to my body. I've never really been very good at, at, at sitting on the couch and resting. So messy hair is a constant, uh, but you can see a much more rested individual uh, on the right photo in 2020 after I'd left my intense job with all the travel and started to truly take care of myself. I realized then that I'd been sleep deprived my entire life. It wasn't isolated to Google or to the work travel there. Um, even when I was a little kid, I wanted to stay up, you know, as late as my older brother. And, uh, you know, he was the kid on the left who happens to be a night owl. And, you know, after staying up too late the night after night, I would suffer these painful mornings afterwards when I felt so tired, I felt like I was Velcroed to my bed. And I played sports in high school and college, and we often had away games at other schools, which required long bus rides. And I sometimes found myself feeling a bit of dread at the end of these long bus rides when we'd finally arrived at the opponent's field, because this meant my much needed nap was over. So as I started to prioritize sleep and realize how truly essential it is, I became inspired uh, to develop a course, which I taught to fellow Google employees as a 90 minute course. So every time I would travel to another office for my day job, um, I would teach Sleep 101. And right around this time, counterintuitively, um, my health took a nosedive. And in July of 2019, I was diagnosed with something called the Epstein-Barr virus or EBV. And this is actually quite common. And, and some of you might be familiar with mononucleosis or mono. In fact, you might've had it yourself. It's pretty common actually in college um, when kids get it from staying up too late or eating a less than nutritious diet. Um, and I got it actually in high school, um, probably just from studying too much and, and playing three sports and just being completely overextended. But then I got it again as, an, as a, you know, many years later and it was a much more advanced version. And um, I, I was so exhausted that I couldn't even work out. I had to take a three month leave of absence from my job. My body said enough's enough. And eventually I left my job at Google altogether I moved to Bozeman, Montana a year ago, and perhaps one silver lining of COVID is it's really forced me to be less overscheduled and that doesn't come naturally to me. So that brings us to today into this webinar. And my goal is that you'll also be inspired to prioritize sleep and you'll agree with me, we really can't afford to not prioritize it. Rest is such a huge component of having balance. And hopefully none of you will reach the point of having EBV or total burnout like I did before coming to this conclusion. And I think it's really important to bring this up because my guess is that some of you on this webinar might be from the same cloth. You know, whether you're an MBA student or you're on the faculty and staff at Georgetown, whether you're an alum or whether you're a prospective MBA student, my guess is that there's a lot of type A overachievers on this webinar who might be able to relate to the notion that it comes more naturally to us to put our foot down more firmly on the gas pedal rather than take our foot off the gas pedal. And with sleep, it's, it's both a quantity and a quality issue. So it's not just about more hours in bed, although that's part of it, but it's also about ensuring that the sleep we do get is as restorative as it can be. So it's only when we're really truly well rested that we can do everything in our lives as well as we can. It really truly fuels our personal and professional dreams. And now with COVID, you know, it's a really unusual time, as all of you know, you know, how many of you are now working or studying from home? You know, how many of you are feeling work and personal boundaries are blurred? And on top of that, you know, some of you are homeschooling your children at the same time. So many of us are dealing with far more stress and anxiety than ever before about a hundred things, you know, whether it's COVID, whether it's racial injustice, whether it's, you know, how to teach your son's third grade math, whether it's the election we just had last fall, whether it's the Supreme Court, there's so many things going on. And so I just applaud all of you for taking the time uh, to explore such an important topic, sleep. I wish I knew, uh, you know, 
a decade ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, what I do now about this topic. So we'd love to use the chat board for this one. Um, I have a question for all of you. And be sure you apply, be sure you reply to panelists and attendees so that folks can, can see your responses. The question is, where was your best night of sleep? What were the circumstances? You know, was, was it in a special place? You know, were you on vacation, which often tends to be, uh, you know, when people have flexibility and, and no stress? Um, please write into the chat board, you know, what were those circumstances uh, that led to a really, really fantastic night of sleep? And the reason I ask this is it's, it's worth talking about because there might be elements of the best night of sleep um, that we can try to recreate in our daily lives. So while folks are um, typing into the chat board, I'm gonna share with you my best night of sleep. So these are two screenshots from my phone. Um, and I use um, the Aura Ring, um, which is a sleep tracker um, on my finger. Um, and great, thanks, thanks folks for, for chiming in there, that's great. Um, and I've been using the Aura Ring for almost two years. And these two screenshots from the Aura app on my phone are showing my best sleep in memory. Uh, this was a night after being at a rustic hot springs in Oregon, uh, where I've been many, many times, and I sleep extremely well. Uh, some of you might be familiar with it. It's called Brighton Bush. And, you know, you can see in this diagram here that my total sleep was nine hours and 56 minutes with no awakenings all night long. I always sleep extremely well there, and it's not a mystery as to why. Um, you know, and a lot of folks are mentioning vacation in the chat board, which is which is not a surprise. And um, you know, that's that you know, there's often a lot less stress when we're on vacation. Um, I always sleep extremely well at Brighton Bush because there there's no caffeine there, there's no alcohol there. I eat a really healthy dinner every night early before 7 p.m., and I spend the days soaking in hot springs, hiking, and reading. I can't use my cell phone. I can't use any other technology. There's no EMF radiation from cell phones. And my body loves all these things. It gets dark really early. I go to bed when it's dark. You know, and sadly, Brighton Bush actually burned down from the wildfires last fall. So I didn't go, not even because of COVID, but because they, it burned down. So they're rebuilding now. So great. These are all fantastic things into the chat board. Thanks, everyone, for sharing all these uh, great, uh, great things. It's really interesting to just see what can we actually think about and what can we adapt from those best nights of sleep ever. And now the next question, I'd love to use the chat board as well is, feel free to type in an example of one of your worst nights of sleep ever. You know, the circumstances might have been out of your control. You know, maybe you were in the waiting room of a hospital. You know, maybe you were stressed out about a job interview the next day or an important presentation. Or maybe you were stranded at the airport on a layover. Or perhaps you don't sleep well on nights when you work late on your computer. Um, so similarly, um, you know, I think it's interesting to take notice of these variables and to avoid factors in our control that may have contributed to that worst night of sleep ever. Um, and thanks, yeah, Jack says, knowing I have to get up early. Yeah, that's a, that's a horrible feeling. You're already kind of stressed out when you're going to bed. Um, Carrie mentions with an infant, which is really common. Uh, yeah, thanks everyone. These are these are um, these are great uh, great comments. So I'd love to hear um, in the chat board if any of you currently track your sleep, and if so, with which technology. So I've mentioned uh, the Aura Ring O U R A that I use, um, but there are a lot of other solutions out there. Um, the Jawbone is one. Um, Whoop uh, is another. The Apple Watch or the Fitbit. Um, if any of you use those things, uh, feel free to type that into the chat board. It'd be great to see um, the spectrum from all of you. Now, I'd love to turn to last night, um, and I know some of you track your sleep and some of you don't, but please write an estimate into the chat board of how much sleep you think you got last night. And a few things to keep in mind is, you know, when we estimate our sleep the night before, it's very common to overestimate how much sleep we've gotten. So as an example, you know, if I went to bed last night at 10 p.m. and I woke up this morning at 6 a.m., it would be really easy for me to conclude that I got eight hours of sleep. But in reality, as we all know, that you know, sometimes it takes time to fall asleep, you know, some nights more than others. And then we often wake up during the night. Um, even if we're not aware of it the next day, we sometimes have brief awakenings. So the actual number of hours slept is likely to be a lot less than eight if you went to bed at 10 and woke up at six. And that's just one of many reasons 
why I really like uh, sleep trackers because it gives it just a much more accurate assessment. Um, and I think there's some truth to uh, author Peter Drucker's famous quote, you can't manage what you don't measure. And I know, you know, look at the end of the day, I think it's really clear to you and to me that on the mornings when you wake up and you feel refreshed from a great night of sleep, that's pretty clear versus mornings when we wake up feeling not as great or worse. But we, you know, how we feel, of course, is, is the best indicator, but I'm a firm believer that a sleep tracker can provide so much great data that we can dig into that can really help us make tweaks in our behaviors the day before, in our bedroom environment, in our sleeping schedule, and in our wind down routine. Um, and the way Aura works is just one example is it, it has sensors in the inside of the ring that monitor your body's pulse and movement and temperature. And then it summarizes your data into three scores. You get a sleep score in the morning from the night before, you get a readiness score, and you get an activity score of how you did the day before. And it has three elements. It has a physical ring itself. It has an app uh, on your phone, which is what I showed you a screenshot of before. And then it has a dashboard uh, from, uh, that you can access from, from your computer. Um, and because I found this data so invaluable, I've actually made it an essential component of the signature sleep course that I teach, Six Weeks to Better Sleep, that meets an hour a week by Zoom for six weeks. So I'd love to take a look at uh, some, of the, some of the myths um, about sleep. So first, here's the fundamental question. You know, how much sleep do we actually need? We're all really busy people, you know, whether you're an MBA student or a faculty member or staff member um, or an alum or a prospective student, my guess is that time is a limited resource for all of you. In fact, perhaps it was even a challenge just to get on this webinar today on Friday. You know, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be great if we only needed five or six hours of sleep every night? How many of you have heard this or you've said this yourself? I can get by on five or six. Does this look familiar to anyone? Well, the truth is um, that only 1% of the population ranges from the recommended seven to nine hours of sleep. And that goes in both directions. So there are actually a few people out there who need more than nine hours. And then there's a few people who are truly okay with getting less than seven. But this 1% of the population has a genetic mutation. So you might be very skilled at being fully functional, looking awake, seemingly alert, but instead of framing it as how much can I get by on, another way of thinking about this is, you know, how can I be at my absolute best in every part of my life from a productivity perspective, from a physical perspective, and from a well-being perspective? So Fitbit, one company that some of you have said you use to track your sleep and your activity, um, has quite a lot of sleep data. And this is a slide that's showing that the average Fitbit user is getting six hours and 38 minutes of sleep a night on average. So just think about how that compares with you um, and how much sleep that you think you're getting. It's only fairly recently that we've started being truly sleep deprived. So this is a Gallup chart and it's showing that in 1942, the average sleep was 7.9 hours per night, and today it's 6.8. A hundred years ago, less than 2% of the population in the US slept six hours or less. But now it's almost 30% of adults in the US that are regularly sleeping six hours or less. And it's even more dramatic with kids. So five to 18 year olds, are sleeping two hours fewer per night than our counterparts 100 years ago. So how many of you have heard this uh, as well, or maybe you've said it yourself? You know, I can make up for it on the weekend. Unfortunately, we can't bank sleep. You need it every single day. And the best thing we can all do is consistently get good sleep throughout the week, whether it's a Tuesday night or a Saturday night. So think about every night as its own unique opportunity. Like busyness, it's a source of pride for many of us, especially those of us who are driven overachievers that we'll sleep when we're dead. Now is the time for living, carpe diem, hurrah. Well, I would dispute that. I think we really need to rethink this all together. We can actually get the most out of every day if we're well rested. From a learning and memory perspective alone, 
getting sufficient sleep is actually the most efficient thing we can do with our time. So the joke sort of on us, for those of us, you know, guilty, right, who, who used to stay up all night studying for exams in college or, for, or in grad school or preparing for a presentation for work uh, till three in the morning, we would have been better off just going to bed. And the benefits are beyond just learning and memory. So when we don't get enough sleep, our body experiences increased inflammation. We have increased levels of the stress hormone cortisol. And that's something that I personally have been struggling with uh, a lot the past few years, as I mentioned, being in fight or flight mode all the time is just not healthy. And it's really shocking the number of health issues that we're dealing with in our bodies, when in fact, um, if we were all well rested, um, many, uh, many of those health issues would not be as severe or they wouldn't be issues at all. Matthew Walker is a professor at UC Berkeley, and he's also the author of a fantastic book called Why We Sleep, and he consults at Google. And he says, sleep is the single most effective thing we can do to reset our brain and body health each day. Unfortunately, many well-known people, uh, including world leaders with enormous responsibilities, didn't get the memo. Um, all the folks on this screen um, didn't prioritize sleep or don't prioritize sleep. As just one example, um, Thomas Edison thought sleep was a total waste of time and he tried to minimize it. He followed something called the polyphasic sleep cycle, which describes having many sessions over a 24 hour period, which is in contrast to what most of us do, which is a monophasic pattern when we sleep in one big chunk of time during a 24 hour period. And he, he would get three hours of sleep total during a 24 hour period. And Leonardo da Vinci was even more extreme. He would take a 20 minute nap every four hours. So over a 24 hour period, he would only sleep for two hours total. So, you know, it's just really interesting to think about what some of the folks on the screen might, what their lives and what their accomplishments might have been had they actually been truly well rested. And in contrast, here are some of today's business leaders um, who have a very different approach to sleep and they don't treat it as a burden they actually embrace it. So as a couple of examples, Jeff Bezos tries to get eight hours of sleep every single night and he credits being well rested with helping him tackle decision fatigue. Mark Bertolini is another example. And when he was CEO of Aetna Insurance, he would actually incentivize his employees to get adequate rest because he thought it was so critical. So he would say that if an employee there got 20 nights of sleep in a row um, of seven hours or more each night, he would give them a $25 a night bonus. And that, that incentive is really fantastic because it encourages sleep continuity of really focusing on consistently getting that seven to nine hours without running a sleep debt during the week. So I'd love now to dig into some of the stages of sleep. Here's a typical progression uh, throughout a night of sleep. Um, you have multiple cycles each night. And each cycle of sleep is typically between 90 minutes to 110 minutes and includes both rapid eye movement or REM, which is shown in light orange, which is when you're dreaming. And then it also includes non-rapid eye movement or non-REM, which is shown in light blue. And that's when you're not dreaming. So this diagram is showing five full cycles and we're all having a different number of cycles each night. One of the things to pay attention to is that your REM sleep is the sleep stage most similar in terms of your brain activity to your awake state. Another thing that's really interesting is that most of our deep non-rapid eye movement sleep is concentrated early in a night of sleep. And then most of your REM sleep when you're dreaming happens later in a night of sleep. And you can see more of that light orange color on the right later in your night of sleep. So we've said that REM is rapid eye movement when you're dreaming. And then non-REM is non-rapid eye movement when you're not dreaming. But what does each stage provide for your body and for your mind? And we go into a lot of details of this in the six week course I teach, but for today at a really high level, um, what I wanna share is that it's important to know REM helps us with two things. It helps us integrate the day's experiences with all the rest of your life's experiences, kind of like filing them away. It also processes your day's stressful moments, whether it's a challenging meeting at work, a stressful conversation with your partner, 
uh, concerns about what's going on in politics or in COVID, um, it helps you actually uh, do something called emotional soothing. Non-REM is the restorative stage of sleep when your body has a chance to repair itself. And the truth is you need both REM and non-REM every single night because they perform such completely different benefits. Um, the question on the chat board about uh, if any of these sleep tracking tools are better than others for kids, I've not seen any data about how they might be different for kids versus adults. Um, I will say that I'm a strong advocate for the Aura Ring. I think it's truly the gold standard in terms of accuracy. There's a lot of sleep trackers out there. That's just my opinion, but I don't see why it would be different for kids than for, for, for adults. It's still um, using the same, um, uh, you know, using the same way of collecting information on your finger. So it should be the same for adults and for kids. So I'd love to go into now the risks of what's happening um, to your body when you don't get enough sleep. So I don't think any of you uh, would dream of pulling any of these, you know, gross, dirty dishes out of a dishwasher when they're sitting there and haven't been cleaned. But actually, this is exactly what's happening when all of us are trying to function when we're not truly rested. So what happens is in your brain, you have something called glial cells and um, and they shrink by up to 60% during non REM sleep. And that's a good thing. If the glial cells were represented by these plates, it's as if these plates had shrunk and there were more there's more room in between them to clean them. And in your brain, more space around the neurons means your cerebrospinal fluid can clean out all the metabolic refuse left from the day. And when you don't get sufficient sleep, your brain cells look like these large dirty plates and amyloid plaques can build up in the brain and this can increase your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. Um, in the chat board, the question is REM, um, if REM is emotional soothing, uh, why can it be nightmarish at times? And just a friendly reminder to folks, please, when you type into the chat board, select panelists and attendees so everyone can see the questions. Um, and, and this is a great question. Um, it's actually, you know, people say, well, how do I avoid having bad dreams? Bad dreams are actually a good thing because it's helping your body work through uh, troubling things. And so actually this emotional soothing process works because you're, you're, you're processing things that might be difficult over in your dreams. So it's actually a good thing, even though it might not be pleasant, it's a good thing for you for the next day because you're gonna be better equipped to, to have a sort of a reset emotional compass for the next day. Um, you know, and while there are innumerable health implications when we don't get enough rest, um, today I wanna to focus on two of them. And the first is about how sleep deprivation impacts learning and memory, which I would imagine is a priority at a, in an academic setting like at Georgetown. So if you don't sleep well on that first night after you learn something, you lose the chance to consolidate those memories, even if you get lots of great sleep a few nights later. This is true whether you're studying for an exam, whether you're taking a language class, whether you're playing an instrument, whether you're learning anything at all. So you need great sleep that first night after learning to lock in those new learnings into a safer spot in your memory. Matthew Wolfe calls this the save button, which I really like. You also need great sleep the night before a day of learning so that your, your brain is prepared to learn new things. I can't overstate this point. Because like many of you, I used to work so hard in school, from elementary school all the way up through grad school. And it was often so tempting to stay up one or two more hours to cram more facts into my brain for that exam the next day, because there's always more to learn, right? But this is really an, efficient, an inefficient use of our efforts. You know, I truly would have been better off going to bed. The second risk of not getting enough sleep that I wanna focus on today is the connection between sleep and eating habits. So sleep deprivation impacts our hormones that regulate hunger and appetite. And that makes it really difficult to control our weight when we're not well rested. You know, I know a lot of people, and I'm sure you do too, who pay a ton of attention to their diet and they might, they might also pay a ton of attention to exercise, but they treat sleep very casually. And this is a mistake. Let me share what's actually happening. So you have one hormone called leptin and leptin normally lets you know that you're full, but when you're sleep deprived, you make less of this hormone. So you're less likely to, fear, to feel full. 
And then at the same time, it's a double whammy effect because when you're sleep deprived, you have increased levels of another hormone called ghrelin, which lets you know when you're hungry. So you feel way more hungry than you should. And in addition to that, it's worse because you crave unhealthy things like cookies or chocolates or ice cream or salty snacks. And I'm sure many of you can relate when you're really, really tired or maybe you're you know, jet lagged from a trip. I don't know about you, but I crave really unhealthy things for breakfast, like you know, donuts or things that I wouldn't normally eat. Whereas uh, in a normal situation, I would eat something much more healthy for breakfast, like steel cut oatmeal or something like that. So the encouraging news is that when we get enough sleep, it really can truly help control body weight. There are a lot of things that can interfere with our sleep, whether it's caffeine or alcohol or technology, specifically the blue light from our gadgets or noise or light or temperature or food. And today I'd like to focus on two, caffeine and then the blue light I mentioned from our digital screens. So first let's talk about coffee. How many of you are coffee drinkers? I have become a total coffee addict, unfortunately. I wish I weren't, but I think, you know, I spent so many years of my life not drinking coffee. And then when I arrived at Google, I was always tired. I was always in the wrong time zone. And then we always had these lovely coffee bars with free drinks with, you know, beautiful macchiatos and cortados and other espresso drinks. And now I can't stop. And, you know, what's actually happening in our, in our body is that, um, the coffee's tricking us into feeling alert and awake. And, and, and that doesn't seem like it's an issue. Okay, caffeine's blocking this sleepiness signal that's normally communicated to our brain by adenosine, which is a compound. And that doesn't seem like an issue, but the problem is um, caffeine stays in our system. So a half-life of any drug, as many of you know, is how long it takes for your body to remove 50% of its concentration. And for caffeine, the half-life is five to seven hours. And so that means if, if you're having a cup of coffee at 3 p.m., half of it's still in your system when you're trying to go to sleep later at like 10 p.m. So again, if you have a cup of coffee at 3 p.m., half of it's still in your system at 10 p.m. I'd also love to address decaf because we might think that that's actually you know, a safe bet by having that after dinner. Um, but actually, decaf is not entirely absent of caffeine. So one cup of decaf has 15 to 30% of the dose of a regular cup of coffee. This was really news to me. Um, so this is something to consider. And then another thing to consider about coffee and caffeine is that what might've worked for you 10 years ago or in college might not work today. The older we are, the longer it takes our brain and body to remove caffeine. And you might notice that you're more sensitive to it now than you might've been um, in college or, um, or before. And you know, the other thing to think about is there are a lot of other things we consume besides coffee which have caffeine. Um, and feel free to uh, type into the chat board, what are all the other things that we consume that have caffeine? Um, and Andrew's, while people are doing that, I'm gonna address Andrew's question about what is the research on the effectiveness of night mode on the phones that shift the lighting? Um, and we'll, we'll talk about that in just a second. It's a great question. Um, I will address in just one second when we get to blue light. Um, so Carrie mentions chocolate. Yeah, absolutely. Chocolate has caffeine. What else? Soda, Kelly, great, thanks. What else? A couple other key, key categories and tea. Yeah, thank you, a lot of tea. So a lot of black tea and herbal tea. Uh, and Carrie mentions Excedrin. Yeah, so I think one thing that's, um, that, that uh, some of us don't know is actually, a, there's a lot of medication out there that has caffeine in it. So migraine medications, some painkillers like aspirin and ibuprofen, and some prescription drugs like beta blockers that reduce your blood pressure. And this is really worth look, looking into, you know, please of course talk to your doctor if you take any of those things, but maybe you can take them in the morning instead of in the evening. I had one sleep student um, a few months ago in San Francisco who, um, you know, for her, when she was sleep deprived, she would get migraines. Um, so then she was forced to drink a Coke or take migraine medication, which both really helped her migraine. But then it prevented her from getting, uh, from falling asleep the next night. So it was this vicious cycle. Uh, so it's just something to keep in mind. So let's now talk about technology. Um, how many of you, uh, 
have your phone next to your head at night or you read on your computer or phone or iPad or other gadget uh, in bed. Um, feel, feel free to use the chat board. So when we look at our screens, um, when we look at our screens at night and specifically when we see that blue light that emanates from our screens, what happens is it delays the onset of melatonin and melatonin signals to our body when it's time for sleep. So this is a real issue. Um, and it, you know, it's actually not just the blue light that's the problem. It's also the temptation to respond to one more work email. That's really hard to resist, right? And that can often get us riled up and not in a good relaxed state for sleeping. Responding to a stressful work email should not be the last thing you do before you turn, uh, before you shut your eyes. And 90% of people do use some sort of electronic portable device 60 minutes or less before bedtime. Um, so what's the solution? You know, if you're committed to tackling this issue, um, there's a couple different options here. Um, one is um, you can develop a strict schedule with yourself about you know, when to turn off your gadgets. For example, you might say no phones, no laptops after dinner, no iPads after dinner, or none of those things three hours from bed, or even one hour from bed is better than nothing, right? Another thing folks do is uh, turn off all ringers and put their devices in another room when they go to sleep. So I know some families where they have like a shelf in their living room that's not their bedroom where they all plug in their devices and that removes the temptation from looking at it um, before bed and especially if you wake up in the middle of the night. Other people have a rule about, you know, no technology in the bedroom. And I think that's a great rule. Um, I follow that myself. And other people uh, decide, you know what, I'm only gonna read uh, from printed books and magazines in the evenings so that I'm not looking at all that blue light. So that's one sort of a spectrum of choices. Um, if those options are just crazy and you say, well, Kristen, I have a demanding MBA schedule or I have a demanding career. There's no way um, that I can you know, avoid looking at my screen late at night. Um, a couple other things you can do, and folks have asked about this in the chat board, is you can switch your device to the night mode by going to settings. Um, or you can get the Flux app on your devices. And basically what those things do is they um, they um, change the lighting on your gadgets so that you're not getting as much blue light. Um, other people have asked in the past, well, what about the, the, the Kindle? Um, the Kindle Paperwhite is certainly a better choice in terms of having less blue light, but the Kindle Paperwhite does not have, Paperwhite does not have zero blue light. So I would say those things are, are, are sort of band-aids and the better thing to do would actually be tr to try to not be uh, looking at your gadgets right before bed. Um, a final option is um, they have uh, something called blue blocker glasses, which some of you might be familiar with, which protect against that blue light. And you can order these. There's a bazillion options out there. You can look on Amazon and other websites. I happen to like a brand called True Dark, T-R-U-D-A-R-K, which is the company founded by Dave Asprey from Bulletproof Coffee. Um, and I have a, um, a version on there called Twilight. That's the model that I have. And I wear those uh, in the evenings if I'm watching a movie, uh, I'll definitely wear those. And you know, if I have to work on my computer late at night, I will use those, but I try to avoid it. Um, and you know, um, the, the, the next uh, slide I wanna share is about our circadian rhythm. So this is our body's internal clock uh, that's helping us regulate our sleep-wake cycle every 24-hour period. Um, in this diagram, um, you know, we can see how two of our hormones, uh, cortisol and melatonin, are changing throughout a 24-hour period. So the light blue background is showing daytime, and the navy background is showing nighttime. In addition to that, there's two squiggly lines. You'll see the red is showing cortisol, and the blue is showing melatonin. And this diagram is showing how these hormones typically rise and fall depending on what time of day it is. So in a typical day, your cortisol spikes in the morning and then it declines until it's very low at night. And then um, for melatonin, it's highest in the middle of the night. And there's three takeaways I wanna share from this diagram. So first is it's illustrating why it's so challenging to pull an all-nighter or to do shift work, like working in an emergency room all night or being jet lagged. 
because our bodies are out of sync with the natural environment of light and dark. It's also showing why the blue light from our devices, like our phones and tablets and laptops, is so problematic because that blue light is delaying the onset of our sleep hormone melatonin, pushing ahead your time to fall asleep. You feel tired but wired in the evenings if you've often been on your gadgets uh, late. And then finally, I'm showing this diagram because it's helping to illustrate why the consistency of your sleep time is so critical. And the reason it's critical is it's helping your body lock in a circadian rhythm. You'll start waking up eventually without an alarm if you're well rested and your body knows what time it needs to wake up. So if there's one thing you take away from this webinar, it's this idea of consistency and trying to have the same schedule, whether it's a Tuesday night or a Saturday night. And I know this is really hard, but this is probably the best thing you can do to get better sleep. And I'm gonna just address a couple of questions here in the chat board. So in, Antonio asks, is taking a melatonin supplement a good idea? Um, I think melatonin has a time and a place and I'll tell you what I think it is. I don't think it's a good idea to be taking it every single night. I think there's so many other behaviors, many of which we talk about in this webinar of things you can do to change your day and your evening before going to bed that can help you get better sleep before having to resort to melatonin. I do think melatonin can be helpful occasion on an occasional basis when you're uh, traveling to ma across massive time zones. So as an example, if you're in DC and let's say you're going to Europe, um, you know that's a pretty big time difference. Um, and I think taking a small amount of melatonin for a couple of nights to just help you get into that new time zone can be helpful, but it's not something I'd recommend taking every single night. Uh, and Carrie asks, what might, what might be the cause of falling asleep without too much trouble, but bolting awake about 15 minutes later uh, and then up for hours? Uh, is it screen related? Um, possibly, Carrie, it could be actually a, quite a number of different things. It might be that you have quite a lot on your mind. It might be that you um, were woken up from noise or light or, um, um, or uh, something else. Um, and so, but I think, I, I think it's, it's really different for everyone. Um, but sometimes certainly when you have a lot on your mind, maybe you've had a very stressful day. Sometimes it's easy for our mind to start, um, you know, uh, going down a different path and thinking about and, you know, over assessing everything that happened during our day uh, when we're really busy and have a lot going on. So that might be one thing. Um, so as I've said, consistency is critical. Um, what is a sleep schedule that might work for you this week? So for those of you who are interested in trying this, um, I'd be interested in uh, having you share into the chat board, um, what time would you be willing to try to going to bed for the next seven nights? And what time would you be willing to wake up for the next seven mornings? Uh, feel free to, to, to type in what might be realistic for you uh, into the chat board. Great, thanks, Chris. You're the first brave person, 10.30 to 6.30, that's great. 1 a.m. to 8 a.m., okay, um, great. Feel free to keep, keep typing into the chat board and I'm gonna just share um, a few other things that we can all do. Um, so in addition to having a regular sleep schedule, another really impactful thing that you can do is develop a wind down routine. And this would include relaxing behaviors. So in addition, doing those same relaxing behaviors uh, every night provides a cue to your body that you're approaching time for sleep. Some people take a warm bath or shower, or if you're fortunate to have access to a hot tub or a sauna, um, doing those before bed can have great results uh, for your sleep. And what's happening is it's, it's counterintuitive, but the warm bath or shower actually cools your body a couple of degrees. And what's happening is your body temperature uh, any night needs to drop to initiate good sleep. That happens for all of us. And when you take a warm bath or shower, your blood flow brings this heat from your core to the surface. So basically a warm bath or shower before bed is actually helping uh, prepare your body uh, for sleep. A few other suggestions um, for a wind down routine. Um, one might be dimming the lights after dinner or even switching the candles. Um, especially if you have bright overhead lights in your house, maybe you really don't need to have those on full tilt late in the evening. Reading a real book or magazine, right? What a novelty. I mean, I've just recently rediscovered the 
the library and the Bozeman Library is amazing where I live. And um, A, it's just fun to be able to go get a book and, um, you know, also have rediscovered fiction, which is really amazing and really nice to be reading before bed as opposed to reading other things that, that rile me up. So reading a real book or magazine is something that's, um, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a great idea. Uh, listening to relaxing music is also fantastic. Drinking herbal tea that does not have caffeine. Spending time with a loved one or listening to relaxing sleep stories. There's a number of great apps out there. Have any, do any of you use Headspace or Calm? You might use them for meditation perhaps. Is anyone a Headspace or Calm user? Feel free to use the chat board. Great, Andrew says Headspace, awesome, awesome. Yeah, both Headspace and Calm are fantastic. In addition to the meditation uh, offerings that they have, um, some of you know that they also have sleep stories. These are basically like adult bedtime stories with someone who has a very relaxing voice. And um, these can be a really great solution. And some of you might be saying, well, Kristen, you've just told us to remove our phones from our bedroom. How can we possibly you know, listen to um, Headspace or Calm, but also have our phone in another space? And this is a very good point, um, I would say, you know, what's, what's great about Headspace and Calm is that hopefully you're not looking at the screen, hopefully you're just listening to it. Um, so that's just one call out there. Um, and, um, oh great, Jack, thanks for sharing that. Uh, the Insight Timer has great sleep meditations. That's fantastic. Um, I will look into that. I've heard great things about Insight Timer, both for, for also for meditation. Um, so as important as it is to engage in relaxing activities before bed, it's also really important to avoid others, like staring at our digital devices or exercising late or eating dinner late. So how we spend the time leading up to bed matters. It can really make the difference between a great night of sleep and a poor one. So um, in the chat board, if you haven't already, please share one thing uh, that you do in the evenings, or perhaps one thing that you plan to do starting tonight to wind down. And Chris mentions um, using calm sleep stories uh, for kids. That's fantastic. That's a great, uh, that's a great example. Um, so what's one thing that you might start doing tonight? Use my hot tub, Julia. Great. I'm jealous. Those are so helpful. They make such a difference. Um, shutting off technology early, reading something boring. Absolutely. Uh, that can be a great solution. Sometimes I found even with fiction, if I'm reading something that's so good, it's just really hard to, um, to put it down. You know, it's always the one more chapter syndrome, right? Uh, Carmen says no snacks after 8 p.m. Kelly says leaving my phone out of the room. Um, that's fantastic. Yeah, Jan mentions calm magnesium supplement. Thanks for bringing that up. I love um, calm magnesium supplement. It's something you can buy. It comes in a canister. Um, it's basically just a magnesium powder that you can put into herbal tea, or I like putting it into um, warm water. And um, it just provides magnesium, which is really helpful for sleep. A lot of us are, de um, are, are deficient in magnesium. So that's one thing that's great to do. And that's something I do every night. Um, reading, uh, meditation, uh, you know, no snacks after eight. These are all great examples. Thanks for, for sharing all of these. Uh, fantastic. So I'd love to share a few takeaways. Um, so one is the vast majority of adults need seven to nine hours of sleep per night. Um, we can't make up for sleep debt on the weekends. So maintaining a consistent sleep schedule all seven nights of the week is really critical. We have a circadian rhythm, um, which regulates our sleep-wake cycle throughout a 24-hour period. Caffeine, alcohol, light, noise, temperature, eating and exercise all impact our sleep. And there's a question in the chat board about um, uh, exercising before sleep. Is there a general rule of thumb to follow? Yeah, great question. First of all, exercise is a really important thing to get in general during the day for your sleep especially getting outside. And the reason why getting outside is great, um, I mean, there's all kinds of evidence about you know, being in nature and biophilia and all that, but it's also just simply the light, getting vitamin D during the day, ideally in the morning from being outside, even just getting out for like a 10 minute or 20 minute walk is still great and, so, and really better than nothing. 
However, when we get rigorous exercise late at night, like for any of you who like to eat dinner and then work out a couple of hours later and then try to go to bed an hour later, that is not a good idea. And I would only recommend very, very light yoga or light stretching or, or perhaps a light walk in the evenings. Otherwise, if it's at all possible, I would try to shift your exercise routine to during the day. So think about it as at least three, you know, give yourself at least three hours before bed. Um, otherwise it can interfere with sleep. Um, another question is, um, how does the Calm Magnesium Supplement differ from regular magnesium supplement pills? Um, I'm not aware of them, there being any difference. The Calm Magnesium Supplement, it's just a powder um, and um, it's just a different format of taking it. Um, so I'm not aware of any different impact on your body from um, taking a magnesium pill versus taking um, Calm powder, which essentially is just pure magnesium powder. Um, a the question about, uh, could you comment on chronotypes? Yes, great question. Um, some of us are naturally um, early birds where we feel really alert and awake in the morning. And um, maybe, you know, for those of us who are early birds, we might be the first person to leave a party in the evening um, because we're just, we just really crash in the evenings. Of course, nobody's going to parties now because of COVID, but in another world when we were, um, we tend to often leave events early. Um, the other, uh, other chronotype is, is uh, the extreme is the night owl. Um, and night owls tend to be, have way more energy in the evenings and it's really hard for some of them to, to go to an 8 a.m. class um, or to have a meeting at 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. And unfortunately our world, especially the business world is really geared around early birds and not really around those folks that might be at their peak at like five or six or seven or 8 p.m. And some people have flexibility in their work environments um, and are able to adjust when they work. And if that's the case, you're very fortunate and that's great so that you can cater around your optimal energy. But for the rest of us, one thing you can do is really think about managing your energy throughout the day, whether you're an early bird or night owl or somewhere in the middle, think about when are you at your absolute peak in terms of energy? So for me, for example, I know that it's really like, frankly, now it's like around, well, for, for me, it's around 10 a.m. Uh, mountain time. Mid morning is the best time for me. For other people, it might be, frankly, at 7 p.m. when you might feel most productive or most creative. I would say if you have the ability to target your activities, your work activities around your, that sweet spot of when your brain feels freshest and most alert, do your most important things then. Do expense reports or you know, scheduling or something that might be more mindless at another time of day when you're, when you're not at your peak. So for me, I used to do my expense reports in the afternoon when I was tired. That was like a good schedule for me. Um, so another couple of questions, these are great questions, thank you. Um, what are some tips to keep a cool room? Um, so of course this depends on, depends on your climate. Um, you can, you know, it's winter now for most of us. So um, turning your uh, thermostat down. So trying to keep your bedroom between 60 to 67 degrees Fahrenheit is considered the sweet spot. Another thing you can do um, is they have a lot of uh, interesting things out there now, which are cooling mattresses. Um, there's one called the Uller and another called the Chili Pad. They're made by the same company. And basically these plug in and it's basically a pad that goes on your mattress that has cooling, um, little cooling, uh, cooling tubes of water. They go through it, you don't feel it at all, but you can set it so that it's at a lower temperature and um, I actually use the Uller and I'm going to tell I'll share with you in just a minute. Um, if you're interested in that, I interviewed the CEO of Chili Pad uh, for my podcast, North Star Unplugged. And she goes into a lot of detail about the, the, the relationship between temperature and sleep. Matt asks, any advice on making it easier to get up in the morning? Yeah, great question. Um, I think one one thing that can make it easier is simply being well rested. So for some of us, the reason why it's so hard to get up in the morning is we're, we're running a sleep debt. We haven't been getting enough sleep. So try to keep, try to, if you can, back up your going to bedtime a little bit earlier each night, like try 15 minutes earlier each night if possible um, and see if that can help. That's one solution. Um, another solution is getting exercise in the morning and getting light. Um, getting outside and getting light as something you do first thing in the morning. Uh, Chris asks, do you suggest trying to wake up during a certain point during your sleep cycle? 
Great question. Um, it is certainly much easier to wake up um, when you're in a light cycle rather than when you're in a deep sleep. This is one of the reasons why it's so important to try to go to bed and get up around the same time seven days a week because your body starts learning um, your, you know, what the schedule is and you'll find that you start waking up like a couple minutes before your alarm and you will be in a lighter sleep cycle. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Um, Another question on the chat board is, how about people who work country cycle? Is there a way to maintain some normalcy? Um, I'm not totally sure I understand what country cycle means. Is that people who are working across different time zones? Um, if that's the question, and feel free to clarify if I'm not answering it correctly, but um, working across multiple time zones, especially um, international time zones can be very, very difficult. And, um, you know, if you have any control of when the meetings are, uh, trying to not accept or schedule meetings late at night or in an insane hour of the morning uh, would be my first suggestion. Um, but I'm not sure if that's really what you were, what you were asking. Um, Kelly asked about, um, what do you, what do I think about white noise? I think white noise can be a great solution. And for those who don't know what I'm talking about, white noise is um, sort of the background noise coming from for a fan or a white noise machine. And what that does is it actually blocks out, um, you know, snoring or noise from our partner or noise from the street if we happen to live in an urban area where it's noisy outside um, or noise from a pet. Often our pets wake us up and white noise can be very helpful. Um, I, you know, if, if you find yourself waking up a lot from noise, white noise can be a great, uh, a great solution. Um, ah, okay, clarity on this question is people who work night shifts or late nights. Um, yeah, this is a great question. Um, it, this is really hard. So I guess the first thing I would say is that, um, you know, this is really, really hard on our body uh, to, to be working all night and to be um, trying to sleep during the day because we're, as I mentioned earlier, we're completely out of sync with our circadian rhythm of light and dark. Um, for those folks, it's, it's important, if you can, to still try to keep any regularity you can. So even if you have an insane schedule, trying to keep it the same. I think it's really hard when people work in the emergency room, for example, when they might be on call one, you know, one full night and then they're supposed to go back to working daytime shift. I think that's extremely hard. That's basically like flying across the world and coming back. Um, so having a really, really dark bedroom is really critical so that you're trying to mimic nighttime conditions. So that can be done through, you know, blackout curtains is one solution, or even wearing an eye mask. Um, that really can prevent your um, your eyes from seeing any light that might be coming through the windows. And the nice thing about eye masks is that you can travel with them, and they're quite inexpensive. Um, I wear one all the time, even though my current bedroom is pretty dark. There's still a little bit of light coming in, and it's surprising actually how much even a little bit of light can impact your sleep. I use a a brand called M Zoo, M Z O O. Um, and I, I got mine on Amazon and um, it's actually quite comfortable. One of the things I like in this eye mask is um, it, it, uh, it, it has a little um, recessed area for your actual eyeballs. So you don't feel like you have this thing pressing on your eyes. Um, it's also fairly cool. The material is cool. And then I also like that it stays on uh, in the morning, which of course is pretty important to, to ensure your eye mask stays on. Um, Jack asks about snacking close to bedtime. Um, everyone's different, but I'm really a fan for a whole range of reasons, not just sleep related, but also, um, I'm also a fan of intermittent fasting, which is another whole, whole topic. But basically I'm a fan of really cutting off eating uh, pretty early in the, in the night. So, you know, I go to bed around 10 and I try to cut off, be, try to be finished dinner by seven. It doesn't always work out that way for sure. Um, but I really try to um, try to avoid um, eating. And especially if I wake up in the middle of the night, I know that's really tempting to, you know, go open the refrigerator. Um, but actually snacking in the middle of the night is not a good idea. A, because it confuses your body. Your, your body is actually needs to learn that it's in sleep mode, it's not in, uh, in eating mode, but also the light from your fridge is actually um, extremely disruptive. So that's something else to think about. Um, question on the chat board about, do I recommend sleeping with earplugs if you live in a big city with ambulance noise, et cetera? Yes, I think earplugs are great. I am, 
I'm still on the lookout. And if any of you have a, a recommendation, I'd be all ears, but I'm on the lookout for an amazing earplug brand that, um, that actually really blocks everything out because I've yet to find one. I've tried many, many different ones. But I think the nice thing about earplugs is that even, even you know, the, the sort of average quality earplugs are still blocking out um, noise that might wake us up, it kind of dulls it. So it might be snoring from your partner or noise from the street or from your pet, but it, it, it helps us sleep through more than we might have otherwise. So I'm a huge fan of earplugs. Um, how long does it take to retrain our sleep cycle if we change countries, jobs, or life cycles? Um, great question. I think it's different for everyone. Um, in terms of you know, when we're traveling or going across time zones, it takes our body about one day for every hour um, uh, of time zones. So you know, if, if you're traveling from New York to San Francisco, that would be really three days to fully get in that schedule. Um, of course, one thing that you can do if you're traveling, and I have a whole, like literally a whole, a whole course about um, uh, travel and sleep, but one thing that um, is really helpful is trying to prepare your body a few nights before a trip. So for example, if I were traveling from San Francisco to New York for work, um, one thing I might do is start going to bed an hour earlier and getting up an hour earlier from the West Coast so that I'm starting to sort of work my way across time zones and prepare my body. Another thing you can do um, if you're uh, on a, a very short trip, maybe you're only gone for a couple of days, is actually staying in your home time zone. Um, of course, this is easier said than done. If you're someone who lives in New York and you're traveling to San Francisco, it's really easy to just go to bed right after that work dinner and then, you know, wake up at you know what might be 4, 4 a.m. Uh, Pacific time, but might be 7 a.m. from the East Coast, what you're normally in, uh, and then you you know then you have time in the morning to work out and to do emails before all your work meetings start. It's harder to do that the other direction. So if you actually live in New York, or sorry, if you live in San Francisco and you're heading to the East Coast, it's it's very hard to just say, hey, I'm not going to arrive at that 8 a.m. work meeting because uh, it's 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 5 a.m. in my local time zone. So just something to consider. But if if you can stay in your home time zone for a short trip, that's actually least disruptive on your body. Uh, Paula suggests Max silicone earplugs. Thanks for that. Uh, that's a great suggestion. And Michelle says happy earplugs work great. We'll have we'll have to we'll have to try that. Um, Michelle asks any thoughts on on ear sound machines like Bose? Yeah, there's a lot of um, quite quite expensive, frankly, uh, earplugs these days um, that have sound blocking. I have not used any of those. I'm curious about them. Um, what I don't like about some of them that I've looked into is that they communicate by um, by Bluetooth and. Um, I think Bluetooth can interfere with sleep for some of us. So that's one thing that I, I don't like about them, but um, could be worth trying. Sandra asks, should we put blackout shades in our kids' rooms? I think it's a great idea. I think it can make a, make a real difference. Um, it might be easier to put blackout shades in rather than, um, you know, depending on your, your kids and their habits, it might be harder for them to keep eye masks on all night. But um, yeah, I think blackout shades are a great solution, whether you're an adult or a kid. Uh, another question is, what does the research show about using CBD to improve sleep? Um, CBD can actually be a great solution. Um, it helps, it really helps a lot of people with their sleep. I wouldn't recommend the same, same, the same response when someone asks about melatonin. I wouldn't recommend using anything every single night. Um, I think CBD can be helpful, but there's so many other things we can try that, that don't involve um, you know, consuming anything, um, you know, thinking about what's the light in your bedroom, thinking about the noise in your bedroom, thinking about the temperature in your bedroom, thinking about when you had dinner, thinking about whether you got exercise that day. Are you doing relaxing activities in the evenings? Are you staying away from your, your, your gadgets, uh, your, your blue light gadgets? I would try all of those things first um, before trying CBD. Uh, another question is, what do you do if you wake up halfway through the night full of adrenaline, um, no caffeine in the day since 9 a.m.? Yeah, great question. Um, if you wake up and it's really clear um, that you're not going to fall back asleep, um, you know, you've been in bed for, you know, 20 minutes, uh, you know, staring at the ceiling and, and starting to get more and more anxious as you realize you're not falling asleep, 
Um, I would actually get out of bed. Um, I would avoid turning on any bright overhead lights, um, but I'd go to another room or another part of your house, perhaps go to a comfortable couch, and I would either read a real book or magazine, or I would listen to relaxing music, or I would listen to one of those sleep stories that we talked about earlier from Calm or, or Headspace or another solution. Um, and until you get sleepy again, and then go back to your bed and try, try it again. Um, things I would avoid if you wake up in the middle of the night, um, all amped up, um, avoid getting on your computer, avoid getting on your phone. I know it's super tempting, but you're actually only going to delay the time it's going to take for you to finally fall back to sleep again. A, because of the blue light we've talked about, but B, because uh, it's easy to kind of get amped up, even on things that are interesting. It could just be like you're on Facebook or you're on Instagram, or it, it doesn't necessarily have to be um, something stressful, but it could be anything that kind of gets you agitated in any way, a good way or a bad way. Um, the sleep tracker that I recommended earlier, Dan, is called Aura, O-U-R-A. Um, and I really am a, I'm a huge fan. Uh, one of the interesting things about Aura is um, during COVID, um, people found that Aura has actually been really helpful at predicting COVID because it measures your temperature. So people wake up in the morning and they say, they can see that their temperature is elevated for several days. And um, so actually Aura partnered with the NBA and the Women's NBA, um, National Basketball Association, um, to help those athletes with basically being able to predict uh, whether they have COVID or not, as well as helping with their sleep. Um, a question in the chat board from Julia, is there a preferred way to quit sleep aids? Um, yeah, I, you know, good question. Um, I'd first, of course, talk to, talk to your doctor. Um, I would try at all um, with every effort you have to, tr to, to try to get off of um, uh, sleep aids. Um, I think there's a lot of, uh, um, th there's a lot of interesting info about some of the side effects and I, I would really try to get off of them. I would try all the things we've talked about today of developing really good sleep hygiene, developing a great wind down routine, ensuring you've got great exercise during the day, ideally outside, um, doing relaxing things in the evening, um, maybe taking a warm shower, listening to relaxing music. Um, all of those things we've talked about today, I would try those and see if those uh, can be helpful. Um, essential oil suggestions. Yeah, this is a good question. Um, lavender is very relaxing for a lot of people. Some people put lavender oil on their pillow or they have sort of a candle lap with lavender or a little infusion and lavender can be a really relaxing um, oil as a fragrance and also kind of then giving your body the cue that it's, um, that it's time for bed. Um, any advice about how to best address thirst in the middle of the night since drinking water can wake you up needing to go to the bathroom? This is certainly different for everyone. And um, you know, a lot of people really cut off uh, fluids late in the evening so that, uh, so that they're not tempted to wake up and, and use the bathroom in the middle of the night. I would say um, if you wake up and you're extremely thirsty, I'd certainly have some water. I just wouldn't chug um, an entire uh, an entire, you know, Nalgene of water, but I, I would certainly uh, drink water if you're thirsty. Um, I think it's also individual of what people can, can tolerate. And of course, this changes over time and, and um, we're more likely to, to be waking up early uh, the older we get. So this is a very, very common, common theme, um, but I think it's different for everyone. Um, so these are all great questions in the chat board. While folks are still thinking of more questions, I'm just going to uh, continue on because we just have a few more slides today. So um, these were some of the takeaways I've, I've talked with talked about most of them. Um, you know, having a regular wind down routine signals to your body that it's time for sleep and having a cutoff time for technology signals that it, uh, you know, can really help help with your sleep. So here are three things uh, that you can start doing today. So first, consistency is critical. Um, so think about, you know, a lot of you entered into the chat board, um, which was great. What is a schedule you could reasonably stick to for all seven days of the week? You might even enter it into your calendar, sometimes writing things down or telling a friend or a partner what you're trying to do can help with accountability, especially if you have a partner who likes to stay up really late, for example, and you're trying to actually go to bed a little bit earlier, you know, having a conversation about it can really help, um, help you to, to stick to it and, and help make it easier. 
Um, second, um, you know, caffeine and digital screens can have a real impact on our sleep. So really be mindful of both of them. And then third, developing a wind down routine, including paying special attention to blue light. Um, as an example, can you commit to turning off all electronic devices an hour before bed? So if you like what you've heard today and you want to learn more or you know someone who wants to learn more about sleep, I have three resources that I wanted to share with all of you. Uh, I mentioned that North Star Sleep School has a signature six-week course, um, Six Weeks to Better Sleep. And this is a course that meets for an hour each week by Zoom. It's in small groups, one-on-one -on -one or two-on-one, -on -one, if you have a partner who wants to join um, with you. And we dig into a lot more detail um, than we can cover in today's 90-minute session about, you know, why are your workouts better? Why are your food choices better? Why is your mood better, your productivity, and your ability to learn when you get better rest? And what are all the different tweaks? We've talked about a lot of tweaks today, but what are all the tweaks we can make in our day-to-day -to, -day to support better sleep? The next course starts March 15th, a Monday, and it meets for an hour each week online by Zoom. Um, and again, there's one-on-one -on -one, uh, classes as well. If you have any questions about the course um, or you're debating doing a small group versus private class, please feel free to email me or you can go to my website at northstarsleepschool.com and you can set up a free 15-minute consult by Zoom. I'd be happy to chat with you. Um, a second resource I wanted to share today is my podcast called North Star Unplugged that I launched in August. And it's, the podcast is about rest and rejuvenation. And it's also about unplugging from technology. And you might get some really helpful sleep tips. All the content's free. Uh, and I hope you'll be as inspired as I have by the guest stories. Um, you can find it by going to North Star Sleep School's website, or you can go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Google Podcasts. And here are a couple of examples. Here are four episodes that might be of interest. Um, uh, Charles Hall, episode eight, um, he invented the waterbed, really interesting guy, and also invented another, a, a number of other, um, um, uh, another, invented a number of other things like the solar shower and the inflatable kayak. Um, Alex Sujung Kim Peng is an author. He wrote in a really great book called Rest um, about how uh, the more rest we get, how uh, it really helps with our creativity. Um, and he also wrote a book called Shorter, which is about thinking about the idea of a four day work week. Um, and then finally, he has a third book, um, The Distraction Addiction, which is really all about refocusing our relationship with technology. Uh, Tara Youngblood, episode 14, is the co-founder and CEO of Chili Sleep. That's the company I mentioned earlier, uh, which makes products uh, like the Chili Pad and the Uller, uh, which I use, which are cooling pads for your mattress. And there's really a, so she really has a lot of resources about how temperature and sleep are so connected. And then finally, episode 16 is Thea O'Connor from Australia. Um, and she talks about the restorative benefits of the power nap. Um, why should we be doing it? How can we do it, et cetera? So check it out. Uh, let me know what you think. I'm always open to feedback. Um, so thanks so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, here's my contact info. And um, I have a, a, an e-newsletter uh, that has updates on future sleep classes, future podcast episodes, and other free sleep resources. So um, if you're interested in that, just scroll to the bottom of any page of my website. Um, and you can sign up. So if there are any additional questions, feel free to enter them into the chat board. Um, I'd be happy to take any additional questions. These, these have all been great questions. Thanks for being so engaged in the chat. Kelly asks, do I have any privacy concerns with biometric trackers? Um, and, and I'll share the summary slide uh, that Carmen asks for. Give me just a second here. Yeah, the privacy issue, I mean, pr privacy is, um, is, is, is definitely really important. And I know there's so many concerns these days with, with social media and privacy. Um, but with the sleep trackers, I mean, you know, I actually voluntarily uh, gave all of my sleep data to the University of um, California, San Francisco, to their, their medical system, because they've been really trying to learn more about um, sleep and COVID. And I, I wanted to be helpful in that. Um, you know, it's learning information about, you know, how much sleep I'm getting a night and 
how much exercise I'm getting a day, which I'm less concerned about anyone really knowing that. I don't, I personally just don't, I, it, it, it's not personally sensitive to me that other people know about that. So I'm okay with that. Um, you know, I think um, there's other things I'm more concerned about from a privacy perspective. Like, um, you know, I had an email conversation with one of my previous podcast guests about, um, of, about a backyard um, stove. And, um, you know, now I'm getting all kinds of, you know, Gmail suggestions and ads about the stove, which is just, that to me is much more disturbing than, um, than me sharing my, my sleep data. So, um, yeah, I, I just, I personally, I'm not as worried about that, but I, I can appreciate uh, that it's a, it's a good question. And I know that, um, you know, our privacy does matter. Um, what is the impact of sleep of, of EMF Wi-Fi being on 24 seven in the house? Should we turn off Wi-Fi, turn off and remove cell phones from the bedroom? And how would you track sleep with all devices off? Great question, Lauren. Um, yes, EMF is a real thing. Um, and I know that I personally am very sensitive to it. And this is actually one of the reasons why I get amazing sleep when I'm at the, those hot springs I mentioned earlier. If you are, you know, I have a whole section about this in my course, but if, if you are a, um, in an environment where you have control of the Wi-Fi and you can just turn it off for the night, even for just, you know, you can set it so that it goes off for six hours or eight hours or whatever, I would definitely do that. Um, sometimes this is not easy if we're in an environment where we have other people using the Wi-Fi late at night or, or roommates or whatever. But yes, if you have control of it, I would turn it off. Um, and, um, the second part of the question is how do you track your sleep with all the devices off? So I, this aura ring that I mentioned um, communicates to my phone th through, through Bluetooth and I have it set through the aura app in my phone on airplane mode all the time. The only time that my aura ring is not in airplane mode is during the five minutes every morning when I have my aura ring in the charger and that's when it's sharing all the info from the prior 24 hours. So Aura's collecting info about my, you know, my run this morning, about, um, you know, uh, you know, my sleep last night, all of that in airplane mode. So I keep it in airplane mode all the time and I highly recommend that. So it's still tracking the info, um, just not communicating um, with Bluetooth. Um, question about, do I recommend afternoon power naps? Um, great question. Yeah, I'm a big fan of power naps. Um, the, episode of my uh, podcast uh, with Thea O'Connor goes into a lot of detail about it. And I actually am about to release another episode about somebody who also talks about naps, who has a, a company that sells nap pods for companies. that's pretty interesting called Restworks. And um, I think the key things to keep in mind about, about taking naps is keeping them really short. Um, you know, I think keeping them to like 20 minutes or half an hour is great. What you don't want is you don't want to get into such a deep sleep that when you wake up, it's you're really groggy and uh, you're not feeling fresh. That kind of defeats the purpose. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is I wouldn't do um, a nap late in the day. Like I wouldn't do it at like five or six p.m. unless you have you know huge plans to go um, out partying until three in the morning or something, which nobody, of course, is really doing right now because of COVID. So. Um, I would keep it earlier in the day, maybe like right after lunch, like maybe one o'clock or so um, and keeping it short. So huge fan. I think naps can be really restorative and just trying out different things of what works for you uh, is great. Um, another question is um, how long before bed should we stop looking at our TV and devices and what temperature is recommended to sleep? Is that a personal preference or is there an ideal temp? So for temperature, um, between 60 and 60 to 60 to 67 degrees um, is considered the optimal temperature for uh, your bedroom. A lot of people keep their bedroom too warm. So that's important to keep in mind. It is, there are a lot of preferences certainly, but um, that's actually, you know, supposed to be the best uh, range. Um, how long before bed should we stop looking at TV devices? I'd say, the, the, the more time between turning those off and, and bedtime, the better. Um, I would say, you know, for gadgets, at least an hour before bed. Uh, for me, I know I'm really sensitive to this and I know that an hour is not enough. Um, I actually try to avoid being on my computer uh, after dinner, period. And if I have to be on my computer, I wear blue blocker glasses 
religiously. And if I don't, I pay the price and I lie in bed and can't fall asleep. So I know myself and I know what works for me. Uh, try different things and see what works for you. But I would say at least an hour before bed to turn off all of your gadgets. Um, are blue light glasses actually beneficial to negating blue light and providing better sleep? Or are they just good marketing? What about blue light computer screens? Um, I don't think they're just marketing. I think that, you know, we are all on our gadgets um, a lot of hours of the day. I mean, I don't know about you, but, you know, it's, it's a lot of hours of the day um, that I'm looking at. A, I have a huge monitor and it's giving off a ton of blue light. And so, yeah, I think blue light glasses are beneficial. I think, um, you know, there's a lot of different companies out there. And for some, it might be, it might be, um, it might be just marketing. I use a, a company I mentioned called TrueDark, and I really like those, um, T-R-U-D-A-R-K. Blue light computer screens. Um, I'm not sure um, if you're talking about the, um, the, the film that you can get that, that you buy separately. Um, I think those can be, um, can be helpful, um, but I'm a bigger fan of the, the blue locker glasses. Um, question about what are the ties to sleep and mental health issues? Um, this is like an entire class. Um, there's so much connection. I mean, today we really focused on um, learning and the impact on our um, in, in impact on, on, on eating and our, um, our, our hormones related to eating, but there are so many issues around mental health. There's actually, um, there's like a Venn diagram of um, depression, anxiety, and sleep deprivation. And um, so they're, 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 they're directly connected and there's so much more, uh, we could go into that for a whole class. So yeah, they're, they're directly connected. Um, do I have an opinion on having an overhead fan on all night, even in winter for ventilation purposes to increase sleep? Um, I don't know about really the ventilation. I might say that, um, you know, if it's keeping you cooler, um, that could be helpful. Um, and then also, frankly, sometimes the white noise from fans um, can, be, can be useful as well um, to block out, you know, snoring partners or other noise. Um, Jeffrey asks, some people swear they can't fall asleep and unless the TV is on, how might they be persuaded to shift their belief? Yeah, this is a really bad habit and I'm guessing that you're suffering the consequences of this if this is someone um, who's your partner. Um, yeah, I, I would say that you know our, we prefer silence and this is just simply like a, a bad habit that this person has gotten into. Um, you know, for you as a short-term solution wearing earplugs, you know, but it's, there's also light emitting from the television as well. So, uh, you know, wearing earplugs and wearing an eye mask could be a, a quick fix, but perhaps if that partner knew how much it was interfering with your sleep, that might um, be persuasive. Uh, there's another question about how important is vitamin D um, versus natural sunlight for our sleep? So one of the benefits as, as Marvin, as you might know, is that, uh, natural sunlight is enabling your body to naturally produce vitamin D. So I would say for all of us, um, you know, depending on what climate we live in, um, it's possible for us to be producing all the vitamin D we need simply by just getting outside. Um, I know it's hard sometimes now, especially with, uh, you know, working from home, studying from home, sometimes we're out of our, you know, all of our routines, but even if you can just get out for even 10 or 20 minutes a day, um, walk around and just try to get sunlight and, and avoid wearing sunglasses during that time. Actually, it's really important that the, the sun actually goes, um, you know, literally through your eyeballs and, and now allows your body to make vitamin D. However, for some of us who, who, are, who are in climates where it's really difficult to be outside, sometimes you might need extra vitamin D. I, do, I personally take extra vitamin D um, every day. I've been taking it for a long time. I've lived in a lot of environments where it's quite dark, like in Portland. And, um, you know, this is, uh, you know, something that's important because most of us are, are deficient. Um, and uh, another question here is um, with Alzheimer's, um, have we seen a rise in diagnosis as people have slept less on average over the past 60 years? That's a really great question. Um, I, I don't have um, a white paper in front of me with that connection, but I would not be surprised if that's the case. Um, as I mentioned earlier, when we're sleep deprived, we have a buildup of amyloid plaques and that those amyloid plaques um, are making us more susceptible to Alzheimer's. So I think that, you know, what you're suggesting is very, very likely, but I don't have a white paper in front of me 
to prove it. Um, so uh, these are all great questions. Um, um, on vitamin D, does it help to sit and work by a large window if you can't go outside? Yeah, I think, you know, sitting next to a window is better than nothing um, it, for, for sure. And um, there's a lot of evidence about just in work environments about just ensuring that we do have enough light. But trying to get outside as well is also like the best thing that you can do. So even getting out for just a short walk can be really energizing and, um, and really helpful. So... Well, I, I really appreciate uh, all these great questions and, and all the energy uh, today from the group. Um, I really wish all of you well. I'd love to stay in touch. Um, I hope all of you um, have a great rest of your day. Uh, have a great evening. Have a great weekend. And of course, I hope you sleep well tonight. So thank you so much, everyone, and, and take care. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you for joining us and sharing all of this valuable information. Um, and so hopefully, hopefully everyone will get some, some better sleep here. Thank you. Thanks, Carrie.